Okay guys, special topic here, MSK ultrasound. Um, it's going to mainly be rotator cuff stuff, uh, but then I'm going to sort of do a little couple of rando topics and include the foot. Uh, let's start out just as a quick review of the rotator cuff anatomy. So here's cartooned out um, a scapula, the back of it, the side of it, and the front of it. Um, just to sort of orient you quickly, remember that if you're trying to figure out which way is the front, look for the coracoid, that thing, um, and uh, that, that's, that's the, the fastest uh, way to, to figure that out, pretty much um, regardless of the, well, especially with the MR, like, sh like oblique and sagittal and stuff cuts, look for the, if you're confused, look for the coracoid, that's anterior. All right, so this is the back of this uh, scapula. And this is where the muscles of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor are located. Remember, the subscap is going to be on, on the anterior surface. So, supra, infra, teres minor, something like that. So, uh, and then here's the front uh, anterior aspect, and that is where the subscapularis is going to be located. So, here uh, are three views of the humerus, a back. Uh, a side and then a front. And remember, we've got greater tuberosity and and lesser tuberosity. The the, uh, the greater one in the green and the lesser in the uh, blue. And that right there is the groove for the bicipital tendon. It's a long end of the biceps that's going to reach up to the twelve o'clock position and attach to the top of the the labrum. 12 o'clock, like a clock face, that's, the, that's where that labral anchor is. Remember, the short head is going to attach to the, the coracoid process. So the long head is the, the one that goes all the way up to the 12 o'clock position. It's got to be longer to do that, long head. All right? And then, so on that greater and lesser tuberosity is where the foot plates or the tendinous attachments of those rotator cuff muscles are going to be. So, um, and you can see that they wrap sort of around so supra infra teres minor and then there's subscapularis on the lesser tuberosity so all the the supra infra and teres minor musculature attaches to the uh, greater tuberosity sort of in that order supra infra teres minor and then you can see that the super fibers wrap all the way around to a portion uh, on the anterior and actually truth be told probably spend, send a couple of fibers over here. And then here's your subscapularis attaching on the lesser tuberosity. And it actually sends a few fibers over uh, onto the greater tuberosity and it creates sort of a, a roof for the bicep tendon. We'll take a look at that here in a second. Okay, so a little more detail. Uh, again, here's your supra, infra, and teres minor. Change the colors just a little bit because I want to emphasize the supraspinatus. That's a tendon that we're going to care the most about. All right, so, uh, and then there's your humerus, and, you know, they obviously they go together like that. So the supraspinatus has two muscle bellies and three longitudinal tendon bands. Um, the anterior portion is larger and originates from the supraspinatus fossa, continuing as a thick tendon that attaches to the middle facet of the greater tuberosity. The anterior portion is stronger than the posterior portion. The posterior portion originates from the uh, scapular spine and the glenoid neck. All right, so something like that. So I'll pull that. Um, there you go. Uh, supraspinatus tendon after the removal of the uh, chromium in the scapula, so you can see a little bit better. All right, now, like I said, um, We've got two muscle bellies, bellies and three longitudinal tendons, uh, and they're going to sort of stretch over here and merge together. Now, the attachment um, of the two tendons or tendon complex is broad. It's referred to as a footprint. Um, and like I said, there are a few uh, fibers that will stretch over on the lesser tuberosity, but for like the purpose of multiple choice, where does the supraspinatus attach? Greater tuberosity and then all the way anterior as well. So that's what I'm talking about when I say uh, footprint, that part. Now, 
For terminology with regarding tears, and we'll talk about this again later, but it's important enough that I'll mention it more than once, you have an articular side and a bursal side, okay? So when you have partial thickness tears, that's how they're described. The top part where the subscapular, uh, sus, subdeltoid, subacromial bursa uh, at the top here, that's the bursal side, and the articular side is the other one or the undersurface. Some people call that an undersurface. That's a little easier to remember. Uh, so um, now, the as I said, the, the supraspinatus is going to come across. It's got sort of an anterior portion and a posterior portion. Those anterior fibers are actually going to merge with the coracal humeral ligament, and the posterior fibers are going to merge with the infraspinatus tendon. So there's a lot of... Uh, interdigitating of these fibers and you know from an anatomist standpoint you know they like to give things names but they, they really all merge there together it's just based on geography where the bulk of one tendon's um, fibers land versus another's so remember this thing we called that the footprint uh, now about one to two centimeters from that is this thing called the critical zone and that is, and it's a critical zone because it's where most of the pathology occurs. It's got the least amount of oxygen or blood flow or whatever, so it's the most prone to tearing, and it's also the most prone to development of calcific uh, tendonitis, which you know apparently has to do with you know oxygen tension, whether or not calcium deposits there or not. So, critical point, critical zone, supraspinatus. Uh, it's the area that is most prone to rupture, and it's about one to two centimeters from, from the footprint. Okay, boom, or calcium. All right, so just to orient you here, we're looking sort of, uh, if we were standing on top of the shoulder looking down, and you were, uh, you were Ant-Man from Marvel Comics, or you're just a miniature person, you're, look at, you're looking down, and here is the greater tuberosity, here's the lesser tuberosity, and like we said, supraspinatus, majority of the fibers are on that greater tuberosity. Subscapularis, majority of the fibers are on the lesser tuberosity, but some of the fibers sort of stretch back and forth, and then there's the corical humeral ligament that's also over the top. So, And that creates like a, an enveloping cavity for the long head of the biceps tendon. And it's also the reason that when you have a tear of the subscapularis uh, here, let's just say this tears, that you'll end up getting subluxation of the bicep tendon. So when I say subluxation of the biceps tendon, you should say subscapularis tear. All right, so here is a look down the barrel of the glenoid um, and biceps tendon attaching to that 12 o'clock position, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis on the anterior side, and these are our uh, glenohumeral ligaments, superior, middle, and then the two in, uh, inferior. All right, so here's a little bit further back, uh, and this is a picture that you may be familiar with anatomy-wise, so again, rotator cuff muscles, Here's that corical humeral ligament. There's where that bicep tendon goes. And then this spot right here is the so-called rotator cuff interval. And that's located between the supraspinatus and the subscapularis tendons. Um, all right, so, all right, one more time here. Out, so a little bit further. This, again, is an anatomical view here. Here's your sits, uh, scapular Y. Um, now, this is how a lot of people will identify whether or not there's atrophy. You can sort of draw a line right there. And if the muscle belly doesn't come up to that or go past it, then there's atrophy. All right, so um, just looking at the humeral head, remember I said that, uh, that the supraspinatus attaches on the greater tuberosity, but so does the uh, infraspinatus and the teres minor sort of further down. The square portion... Of the, of the humeral head is where the supraspinatus hits. The inclined portion is where the infraspinatus hits, and there's actually overlap between those fibers. 
All right, so just a couple of more vocabulary words here. There's a thing called the rotator cable, and there is uh, a thing called the rotator crescent. So the rotator cable uh, lies perpendicular to the cuff tendon fibers, and it's going to blend in with the coracohumeral ligament and transverse ligaments of the bicipital groove anteriorly. Um, the fibers of the rotator cuff that lie lateral to the cable are going to be referred to as the crescent. Now, um, as you age, uh, the cable undergoes hypertrophy, and it acts like a rip stop uh, for rotator cuff tears to protect that crescent area from stress. So you can imagine that fibers are oriented in one direction, uh, the cable is oriented in a different direction, so if there's tearing, it will prevent it from, from going all the way through. So, cable, crescent. All right, so, all right, and that's sort of the intro. Now let's, let's look at some ultrasound stuff. So, show you an ultrasound picture here. So, this is the picture, if someone was going to show you a rotator cuff ultrasound case, this is the picture they would likely show you. Now you may say, who in the fuck does rotator ultrasound for shoulders rotator cuff pathology? And the answer to that is academic centers because they don't they're all they care about is well they don't know how to make money and they're excellent losing money so doing a time-consuming thing um, without a technical fee like an MRI you know would be like yeah let's do that um, it's a good idea it's also big in Europe uh, so and, and actually for looking at the rotator cuff there are papers that say that sensitivity and specificity for ultrasound of the rotator cuff and MRI are actually pretty similar, as astonishing as that may sound. Um, now, from a business perspective, it makes no sense to do this because uh, A, the professional fees less, um, B, the technical fees way less, and uh, it takes twice as long to do because and you have to have a dedicated sonographer who knows what the hell they're doing, and uh, it's just stupid. But academic guys eat this stuff up, so... Uh, that's why we're doing it, and um, I can hit, you, hit the we'll hit the big stuff here so uh, that it makes sense. Now, um, so like I was saying, this is a picture you're most likely to be shown, okay? And if none of the tape, uh, if you're not really given any clues or told what it is, just assume it's a supraspinatus uh, until uh, told otherwise. Yes, if you're good at ultrasound of the shoulder, you can actually tell which tendon it is based on the morphology of the humeral head. That is beyond the scope of this test. Um, so let's just say that this is actually super and infraspinatus tendons, all right, but irrelevant, okay? So just a quick um, review of what we are looking at here. So that's a de deltoid musculature that's more superficial. Um, this is the bursa, which should be thin. Uh, if in a normal situation, you should shouldn't really even be able to see it other than like a thin line. This is your rotator cuff tendon, and then a little bit of cartilage, and then humerus um, down below that. All right. So just a quick like I'm only showing you this for the purpose of what if they ask you a positioning question. This is the most likely positioning question that they will ask. So here's a. We're looking at a shoulder here. This is an MRI, obviously. And here's the supraspinatus, infraspinatus musculature, and that's the stuff that we care about. Um, and remember, because we're doing ultrasound, you have to have a sonographic window. So bones, like these things, are in the way. You can't really scan through them. So here's your sonographic window, and you can see that you're going to be missing that rotator cuff musculature and tendons that, that you actually care about. Uh, so... What do you do about that? Well, if you grab this whole thing here, humeral head and muscles, and you're able to sort of move it forward, internally rotate it, then that would move the muscles into the beam of the ultrasound. In other words, if this is ne neutral, okay, move, 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 this is internal rotation. So if the question is, uh, how should you position the patient to evaluate the rotator cuff, specifically the supraspinatus, uh, the answer is internally rotate. All right, so now obviously depending on where you put the ultrasound probe, you're going to get a different look. Just to orient you here with my cartoon, clavicle, coracoid in the front, chromium 
Um, so if you put the probe here, that's the picture you're going to see, and that's the main picture that I think you should be able to see. But obviously, depending on other spots that you could put the probe, you could even you could get something that looks like this. So that orange one, the top there, and remember this is our cartoon. They're showing you biceps tendon here, sitting beside the um, greater, you know, in the valley of the greater and lesser tuberosities, or um, this here, which looks more like this rotator cuff interval spot. Again, um, this hyperchoic structure here is, is, the, uh, is the biceps tendon, that one. All right, so case number one. All right, so we've got the same spot. This is sort of the image that I showed you, but uh, I've got a yellow box over some pathology. We'll do zoom in, full up. So see this anechoic stuff, fluid? Notice that it's all the way through. This is what a full thickness tear looks like, okay? So just sort of going back real fast. Fluid, remember fluid signal on ultrasound is anechoic, all the way through the tendon from top to bottom, from the cartilage up through full thickness tear. All right, here are two more examples, different patients. You can see fluid signal all the way from the cartilage up, okay, deltoid muscle. All right, so tendon, tendon, fluid, whole way through, whole way through. This is, you know, showing that there's actually, it's actually retracted right. So it's supposed to be just like a toupee and a muscle and tendon cover the entire head. So places where there aren't, tendon is torn retracted area, so. Full thickness tear. All right, next one. Okay, so just sort of cartooning in the musculature here. Partial thickness tear. But which, which portion of the tendon? Remember we talked about this earlier. So the choice could be full thickness tear, normal, partial thickness, bursal sided tear, partial thickness arti art articular sided tear. So this would be an articular sided tear. Okay, so the next case. We've got, uh, again, we're seeing thickened tendon. And then we've got this fluid signal here. So sort of drawing a tendon in. This is another partial thickness tear. Again, partial thickness bursal sided, partial thickness artic or, uh, articular surface could be options, so you gotta be able to distinguish that. This is the bursal surface. So just a real quick review. Remember that the bursal surface is the one next to the bursa on the top, and the articular surface is the one underneath. Okay, next case. So we've, this time we've gotten color on a tendon and showing you that there's more color. How do you know it's too much color? because they put color on there. So if you're trying to figure out whether or not there's too much color or not, if they put color on a tendon, there's too much color. Uh, so this is actually the knee, this is the patellar tendon, but it can be any tendon. So if they're showing you increased flow in a tendon, this is neovascularity, and this is um, one of the signs of tendinosis. Now, uh, tendinosis is not an inflammation uh, academic people are sticklers over that. This is the degenerated tendon. It's not necessarily inflamed. So signs of tendinosis, thickened tendons, hypoechoic tendons, and then this neovascularity from vascular proliferation. It's a diseased tendon, uh, and it's obviously going to be predisposed to rupture. So again, here, comparing a normal tendon to a tendinopathic tendon, the normal tendon is thin, it's sort of uniform in signal, it's got a fibular type pattern to it, and then um, the last one here is this uh, ten tendinopathic tendon, which is thickened and it's heterogeneous and it's irregular, etc. All right, next case. We got that thing, a shadowing thing. All right, so, and it's the same as if I showed you this or if it showed you that. So we're talking about that, 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 and that. Um, so this is calcific tendonitis, specifically cal calcium hydroxyapatite, 
it's going to be dark on MR because it's you know it's not a high it's not going to spin in the magnet it sort of looks like toothpaste amorphous is a buzzword on a plain film and it's in the supraspinatus most commonly and it's at the critical zone most commonly right because we said that that um, it's uh, the most avascular portion of the tendon and that for some reason causes calcium to precipitate all right next case all right the history is going to be um, st uh, st walk works in a lumber yard forgot his shoes walking around the lumber yard with no shoes on now he's got pain so like roll out foreign body but they're giving you clues that the foreign body is going to be wood or a splinter could also be uh, broken glass all over the floor walking around barefoot um, and you've got uh, you got a plain film and you look and you look and you look and you don't see anything and then the next what would, what would be the next best step? Ultrasound. Okay, so remember that wood and glass tend to be radiolucent, so you need an ultrasound. Uh, they can show you an ultrasound, and they can show you something like that. Uh, sort of a linear, hyperchoic thing. Here's another picture. I've got calibers on it to make it a little easier. If you would see like a hypochoic blob on the end of that thing, maybe that's an abscess. Um, but you know, foreign bodies. Ultrasound is a is a actually legit tool for looking for foreign bodies that aren't um, radio dense. All right, another case. This is an MR, obviously, and we're showing you something that's dark. This is a T1, short axis, and then corresponding. Uh, I actually like uh, I like this view better for looking for Mortons, which is what this is. And uh, I think they're easy, actually easier to see on this view, but this is more classic for like case books and gamesmanship and that kind of stuff. Um, all right, now here's the point for ultrasound. So there is a dynamic maneuver that's done clinically called the Molders clinical test. Basically, you take the foot and you squeeze it, uh, and there's supposed to be a palpable click, which is displacement of this scar. Remember, Morton's neuroma is not actually a neuroma, right? It's, uh, it's not a tumor, it's, it's scar, and it wraps around these uh, little tiny nerves that run in between the toes and can be very painful. So you squeeze the foot, it, you, get, you hear a palpable clicking, supposedly, um, and uh, that's like a clinical test that's done in the office. Now under ultrasound, there's an ultrasound equivalent that sort of looks like this. So we're looking right here. You can see something being displaced, plantar displacement of a, of a mass. Um, so if you're oriented to the foot, you know, these are metatarsal bones here. You can sort of see that one. can't see the other one over here, but it's there, trust me. Uh, and you're squeezing the foot dynamically. This has to be shown with a cine. You can't not show this with a cine because it's a dynamic test. Um, I guess they could show you one picture and they could tell you they squeezed and then another one, but that, that would be tough. All right, another case, and this one's in the foot. You can see calcaneus is labeled. You can actually see plantar fascia is labeled, and it's got calipers on it. Well, how do you know if it's too thick? Because they put calipers on it. If it's got calipers on it, then it's too thick. So um, it's usually the medial cord. Uh, it's usually right at the calcaneal insertion. Thickening of the plantar fascia. Um, you could say loss of the normal fibrillary pattern, but I would go with... Any ultrasound picture of the plantar fascia with calipers on it is plantar fasciitis. Okay, so just one last case, and I, this is uh, just a quick physics, ultrasound physics review that's specific for ultrasound of tendons. So um, this is a semi uh, loop. Now I want uh, focus your attention sort of right here. Notice that as the angle of the probe changes, that it looks like that tendon goes from white to white or uh, hyperechoic to hypoechoic. Remember, we said that tears are hypoechoic; they're like fluid signal. So, depending, you know, if you if the sonographer would give you this image right there and say tendon's torn, um, and it was a still, you wouldn't know any better. 
Uh, of course, they could also show you this right here and say, looks fine. So this is um, this idea of anisotropy, which is an, is an ultrasound artifact. Now, why does that happen? Um, so anisotropy actually means being directional dependent. So uh, anisotropic are like directional dependent things, like the origin of the word. So uh, let's say that our fibers are lined up in this direction, okay? Now we send out our ultrasound pulse. It's, you know, we're hitting them, we're coming back, we're generating signal. Well, what if we shift the probe a little bit so that the orientation of the fibers is different? So it's like that. Um, now, when the pulse comes out, maybe it just flies right through. So you can see that, like, depending on, think of these things like as bands, right? It's a tendon, so they're like bands, little tiny bands within a band. Uh, and so if they're not lined up correctly with the probe, they can look hypochoic or they can look hyperchoic depending on the orientation. So anyway, that's, it's a very common um, ultrasound artifact and would be the one that would be most likely to be asked. All right, that's it.